Today is day 25, and we are in Acts chapter 25. Let's pray, and then we'll dive in. God, thank you for today. And we are amazed at what you are showing us through your word, uh, having the privilege and the, the opportunity to open up your scriptures every day. God, we don't take it lightly. We know there are places in the world where people cannot do this. And so, God, we are thankful that we can have your word this morning. We ask that you would teach us, that you would instruct us, that you would shape us. Um, so, God, we're excited to dive into chapter 25. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would open our eyes to help us see what you want us to see. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right. Here we go. The, the trial before Festus. All right. Three days after arriving in the province... Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. All right, let me give you a little context. So, we know that Felix was fired, okay? He uh, was not leading Caesarea and governing that area well. Uh, Nero, Caesar, uh, removed him from office because uh, an issue broke out between the Greeks and Jews. A number of Jews were killed, and so things were really bad uh, in this area. Uh, the Caesar, you know, Nero knew that that area needed to be going well. Uh, there needed to be peace in Rome for them to continue to move forward, build roads, and so on. Uh, so they removed Felix from office, and then they placed in his uh, place Festus. Uh, it's interesting here, we don't really know anything about Festus besides that he was a foot soldier for, for Rome. Very loyal uh, uh, to, to the Roman Empire, to Caesar, uh, to Nero. Probably why they put him in office. He was only in office for two years, so uh, he was just there for, for a couple years, and he's getting his feet under him. He's trying to understand what's going on, and he knew, because Nero probably told him, how important this area was and that he needed to build relationships and regain credibility with the Jews. So he's trying to build that relationship with the high priest of the Sanhedrin, so here we go. He's trying to understand what's going on, all right? All right, there uh, were the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented their charges against Paul. Verse 3, they urgently requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me and press charges against the man there if he has done anything wrong. After spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea and the next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, again, uh, because of all that happened, the Jews, uh, there was, like I explained earlier, so he, he's needing to build some some of that credibility and uh, relational equity back, right? So him wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go uh, up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews or you yourself, uh, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. I do not refuse to die. But if these charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. All right, let me hit pause here. This is really interesting. In the Roman Empire at this time, there was this Caesarea uh, Apello is, is what it's called. And uh, what that meant is any Roman citizen could appeal to Caesar. The reason that they had this, um, you know, uh, the, the reason that they had this in place was that, as you can imagine, there could be some mistrials, and Roman citizens could be treated unfairly. So this was again one of the perks of being a Roman citizen. I mean, it was awesome to be a Roman citizen, part of the Pax Romana. So they said, hey, if you appeal to Caesar, you will get to go to Caesar to make sure that your case is trialed um, fairly and properly. Does that make sense? So. Paul obviously knew this. Um, he, he, he was very well uh, aware of the law. So he's like, all right, if you guys aren't going to do this right, all right, I'm a Roman citizen. This is going to protect me. Let, let's take this on up a notch to, the, to Caesar, which was Nero. All right, to Caesar you will go. Um, okay, uh, that's verse 12. And verse 13, a few days later, King Agrippa and um, uh, Bernice arrived at, at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. All right, let's hit pause. Some interesting things here. Um, is when Jesus was born... Uh, we know that it, Herod the Great was in office. So Herod the Great, crazy, crazy um, 
leader, and he led for 30-something years in that, in that area, King Herod. Now, he wasn't the Caesar of the whole thing, right? He was the king of that, of that area. And he had a son, Herod Antipas I, who beheaded John the Baptist, who then had a son, Herod Agrippa I, Acts 12, didn't give God the cred and was um, just died and was eaten by the worms, who then had a son, you know, obviously before he died, which, which is this guy, Herod Agrippa II. Does that make sense? So I looked up the lineage. The reason that's important as we study, context is everything when we open the word, and we need to understand how violent and terrifying this guy was that was about to see Paul. Everyone knew who this guy was. Herod Agrippa II, everyone knew who his dad was. His dad was 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 crazy, and they certainly knew who his dad was, beheaded John the Baptist, and everyone knew who, uh, who the lineage that they came from, Herod the Great. So um, you can only imagine the scene that was about to roll out. People knew and feared, um, feared the guy that was about to walk in. Now, uh, one little interesting side note, and I was just kind of getting confused at why he would come in and why would he have uh, say, I guess, over things that were going on uh, with, with with the Jews. Uh, the reason, um, I, I can't remember, I wrote it down somewhere, but uh, Rome looked at, at King Agrippa as the authority on the, the, the Jewish religion. So they uh, would entrust different people, and they entrusted uh, King Agrippa II as really the authority uh, on the Jewish religion, he was the, the the curator of the temple. That's the word I was looking for. Um, the the uh, Caesar entrusted him as the curator of the temple, which means he was kind of the caretaker of the temple, uh, the guard uh, guardian, if you will. So um, he had a lot a lot to say within things that were were going on uh, at the temple. Okay, so that's just a little bit of context. All right, so uh, Agrippa shows up. His sister Bernice, she's there with him. Apparently, her husband just died, and her husband was also her uncle. Crazy stuff, right? First century, okay. Uh, so, so they're there together, and they came with great pomp. Uh, that word's just funny to me. Uh, what that means is they they rolled um, they rolled in on like dub deuces, right? They had some major major pomp. The gold was flowing. The um, I mean, if you can only just imagine the the money and the prestige and uh, the pomp, if you will. Okay, and I will. Uh, they, so they entered with pomp and entered the uh, audience room with high-ranking officers and leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I've brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, because he was the curator of the temple, um, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send on a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. This is the word of God. And um, a lot of different things going on uh, here in chapter 25. It's a shorter chapter. Um, but the thing that stands out the most, uh, I gave a, a little bit of, of context for you guys. Um, the thing that stands out the most is how Paul responds in the face of death. Um, I can't remember the, the name of the study, but you know the survey, and you've probably heard of it before, what do people fear the most? Um, I think number one is public speaking, and number two is death. Um, so um, I, I definitely can relate to both of those. Um, but it is fascinating to me to understand the context and how feared some of these guys were, the power that they had. And here is, you know, if you can, I see the scene of all the pomp and all the prestige and all the power and all the gold. And then here's this guy in chains, the apostle Paul, and he does not waver on what he believes. You know, it's interesting how, how they said, you know, he's here because of this dead man named Jesus who Paul believes is alive. The resurrection and Paul's belief on the resurrection is what had him right before these guys who had, you know, uh, they weren't supposed to because he was a Roman uh, citizen, but at any moment they could have taken his life. Um, King, you know, King Agrippa was in the lineage of guys that were great at killing um, Jews. It's... Um, 
I don't think um, really any doubt the the Lucan uh, parallelism here is is fascinating. Of you know, here's Paul standing before uh, King uh, Herod Agrippa II, and Jesus was standing before Herod Antipas. You, know, you just kind of see the parallels here, and we see Jesus uh, f- not fear death, but endure the cross, and then we see you know Paul following suit in the same way, not fearing death, but staying the course, and, and the two observations or two big questions I have for us today is what do you need to die to today? That's question number one. What do you need to die to today? Um, Chances are um, uh, you're not going to need to um, literally die today, but perhaps your cross today is rejection and you need to let go of that. You know, Perhaps you and I need to die to rejection today. Uh, Perhaps you and I need to die to consumerism today. Maybe we need to die to selfishness today. You know, we just continue to put ourselves first and it's ruining our relationships. It's ruining our reputation. What if we can die to that today? Here's the second question is what fear is paralyzing you? What fear is paralyzing you? First question, what do you need to die to? Second, what fear is paralyzing you? Paul certainly had the opportunity for the fear of death to paralyze him, yet there is no sign of paralysis. Paul, who wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your sting? We see him absolutely living that out right here in in, in these uh, trial narratives. He is not fearing death. He is not paralyzed by death itself, but because he knows that the resurrection happened and he's standing on that, that he himself will be resurrected. So death, where is your sting? But what fear is paralyzing you today? And I don't know what that is. Um, I deal with fear all the time. Um, Every Sunday, there's a whole lot of fear that uh, God helps me overcome. But the text, God's word, is meant to remind us that there is no one And there is no authority that can take the very life that God has given us. You know, whether our life ends today or not, there is no one that can take that from you. Death, where is your sting? And my prayer for you and for me and for our church is that we would be a community with distinct courage, as we talked about on Sunday. When we stand on the doctrine of the resurrection, it is meant to create within us a courage Unlike you would see anywhere else, the doctrine of the resurrection is meant to pour into us a courage and fearlessness like we see in chapter 25 of Acts. O oh, death, where is your sting? As Paul once wrote, as I mentioned, and I, I'm, I'm praying that you and I, uh, that we would really think about what we need to die to today, and that we would really be able to identify what fear is paralyzing us today, and we would take that to Jesus, and we would submit that, and we would make those thoughts obedient to Christ. Have an awesome day. We'll see you guys tomorrow morning.